In the year 2050, there will be 9 billion people. How do we feed them safely, fairly and well? And make sure every mouth is fed. Happy Farms, the computer game about farming young people have been going crazy about across China. The player, Sherry in Shanghai. Then strawberries, apples and pumpkins. There's like uh, vegetables and uh, fruits. It's kind of like a real farm. Yeah, it's pretty fun actually. We've set Sherry's social media agency, Residence, a task. Can they make farming as popular with young people in the real world? Residences' hip offices in Shanghai's trendy French concession area show why so many young people love city life. Our challenge, make farming as hip and alluring as life in their office. I think one of the things that, um, that the client wants us to do is figure out, is there a way to make farming more interesting so that, number one, uh, people on the farms think it's cooler to stay on the farms and therefore they don't try to go to the cities or people from the cities might want to become farmers. Californian-born Rand and his wife Sherry are Residence's founders. They use the internet to create and identify trends and tricks that can create a buzz for global brands. Is it possible for us to create a branding campaign that can influence people to want to become farmers, right? So, um, any, any ideas? Here in hectic reality, many young people don't find farming fun and sexy. They're leaving the land. And Residence's research shows it's not just China. We wanted to see if farming can be rebranded before there are too few people left to grow the food we need in the future. Who is going to feed the world come 2050? Is it the farmer of today, the, old, the woman with a baby on her back and a hoe in her hand? No, it's the youth of today. Most African countries have anything from 40 to 60% of the, of the population below 20 years. Why are the youth not attracted to agriculture? They say it's not sexy enough. That's not true. Agriculture is not what is not sexy. It's when you start making money out of a business, it becomes sexy. It's the money that is sexy. You have to show them that you can make money out of agriculture. Then it becomes sexy. There is a public perception that causes farmers to think, if you don't go to the city, then you are backward. This is the biggest issue right now. There's been a progressive tendency to think of farm work as a lowly profession. You see? And that's in the old world. The return to the land is one of the most fundamental questions for the future. Shanghai is booming. In 2010, there were over 240 million migrants from the countryside in China's cities, more than double five years earlier. They're here in search of work, love, or a way to get rich quick. For Rand and Sherry, the bar is another great place to brainstorm reversing the flight to the cities, as well as showing why there is a flight to the cities. Even close to Shanghai, we came across villages where there was hardly anyone under 40. Average age round here, closer to 60. Many much older. Even the bigger villages can seem eerily quiet. Across China, a quarter of traditional farming lands now lie idle. Partly because youngsters don't want to farm. 
Often it's already hard-pressed women who stay in the countryside. Or in some remote corners of China, maybe nobody stays at all. In future, some villages, some townships, will, especially those in the, in, the, in the middle and the western you know, uh, uh, region of, of the country, will be deserted. People will, you know, there will be no people living in those villages anymore. This is a common phenomenon faced by current-day Korea, Japan, and Taiwan province. They all face this problem, so China is not a special case. At the Jia Xian Rice Company, five hours from Shanghai, farmer Xie Tongzhou is 64. His workforce is fighting fit and productive, but their age, average 60, shows the issue we've asked residents to address. The average Chinese farmer is now 50, in the USA, 58, and Japan, over 60. Even if anyone younger wanted to work here, Xie Tongzhou can't afford the wages they demand. Since I can't find any young worker, I go for older people. It's not so easy for them to work in the city. They are willing to work for 20 to 30,000 renminbi. The age of Xie Tong Zhou's 18 employees an issue, but no disaster. Productivity per acre is high. Can I ask how old you are? I'm 66. I'm 56. I'm 67. I'm 63. Xie Tong Zhou has over 100 hectares of rice paddy fields. Of course, one answer to an aging workforce the world over has been to mechanize. But Xie has problems even finding the young people to man the machines he'd need. Rationally speaking, since I have various difficulties in terms of farm labor, I want to look into mechanization. But the problem is, even if I acquire machinery, there is a lack of a tractor and mechanical operators. If you find an operator, you need to train them and pay them well. If you don't pay them well, no one will operate the machines. Zia Tongzhou's own son, Zia Xinwei, left for Nanjing City to be a doctor. He's back visiting with his family. Young people are mostly enrolled in higher education or working in the city, where the income is higher. Life is hard in the village. The sun beats down on them every day. Xie Tongzhou's team used the ancient Chinese farming method of weed-destroying ducks to hoe the paddy fields. But ducks can't entirely replace humans. This is a big problem in our villages. If our generation stops farming, who will take our place? We are worried about this. <laughs> the world's aging farm workforce, nowhere clearer than in Xie Tongzhou's canteen, raising the question, who will grow the food to feed 9 billion people by 2050? Chinese society is paying attention to this issue. There are many discussions regarding who will be China's farmers in 20 or 30 years' time. Who will undertake the work of China's agricultural production? Back in Shanghai and its 23 million residents, many from families who come from remote areas of China. Rand and Sherry continue their research. In many remote areas of China, young people have little choice but to stay on the land. And yet they may face a destitute future, with millions of farm workers in China earning less than $2 a day, and 50 million rural workers currently unemployed. Another side of the coin is that we have still the poor uh, remote areas, uh, what we call the very rural areas, that farmers cannot 
household cannot migrate out and they have to stay on the land. They have to make a live out from those pieces of land. And that, in terms of population, that's a, a big population. And uh, well, we have to support them, uh, support uh, agriculture, which is their main uh, source of income. Uh, this is not just because of uh, food. I think this is more because of livelihood for those people. IPAD, the UN agency that assists small-scale farmers, is working with the government to invest in rural communities. What we are doing is to uh, directly uh, tackle this, this situation. On one hand, creating opportunities in the rural areas for the current uh, labor force, but also try to get back uh, the younger uh, laborers uh, by providing services, by providing uh, infrastructure, by making agriculture more productive and more actually uh, make it more, um, generates more income. Time for Rand and Sherry to review their research. For luxury brands, residents try and involve so-called influencers or trendsetters, celebrities like footballers and people in the news. Could they find such influencers to improve the image of farming? So it'd be sort of an influencer strategy where we get some sort of hero yeah. who's like doing really well and then maybe this guy because he's doing so well he gets in, uh, this might be a stretch, but maybe he, he meets some celebrities like Fan Bingbing or yeah. mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's too far. But he gets a little bit of a lot of face, mm. government guys, he cuts a ribbon, I don't know, something. And then we social media that, mm. and then it just makes everybody else super jealous, right? All the guys who went to the city to make this living, they suddenly realize, oh my god, I could have been this guy if I just stayed in the village and then just really put, you know, some effort into that particular thing. The search on for young farming heroes. Young people will be the new protagonists of a new agriculture. I don't think that the new agriculture will be based on old farmers. Young people will be the new protagonists. So who can residents find to be a role model or influencer? It's off to the farm to find out. Four hours drive from Shanghai, is Big Buffalo's citizen farm in Jiazi County. So, so I guess we're here. And perhaps the first hero and influencer residents are looking for. The farm doesn't breed buffaloes. It grows rice and vegetables and here, geese. The farm's run by Chong Tong Wang, whose PhD is in real estate but who remembered his grandparents' farm and how different life used to be for farmers in the good old days. Traditional Chinese society used to say, out of scholars, farmers, artisans and merchants, it is the farmer who is the strongest and most capable in the family, whilst the artisans and merchants are considered not as capable. Therefore, it is the farmer who is given two bowls of rice and the artisans and merchants only one. Chung's innovation, his team deliver fresh vegetables directly into the homes of city dwellers, avoiding supermarkets and shops. For city dwellers Rand and his colleague Jeff, this kind of farming does seem good fun. Oh, so fun. But they also hear how tough life can be for farmers in China. As a bunch of young students working in agriculture for several years, we learn that the reality of farming is that it's really hard work, that farmers' incomes are very low, and they are right at the bottom of society. The idea took off after recent food safety scandals. Every week, the farm prepares packages of fresh and safe vegetables for households in nearby Changzhou who pay to join up. Today, they're packing food for 80 families. On Wednesday and Saturday, we deliver vegetables we picked in the morning to the homes of our members. This task begins at 4 or 5 a.m. when we begin picking vegetables. Chang's innovation is to make farming more of a profession 
raising the profile and dignity of farming. He and his team even seem a bit hip and alternative. Our farm is considered alternative because farmers around here all grow flour and nursery stock, yet we grow grain and vegetables. Why? Because citizens' needs for healthy and safe agriculture products are on the rise. They are willing to pay five to six times more than the market price for health and safety. Servicing a booming urban middle class could give farmers new status as middle class professionals themselves according to Chung's university mentor. According to international studies, China's middle class has reached almost 500 million. Their demands on agriculture, first of all, are its safety and a diversified selection of food. I think what they want is the same as other middle class people all over the world. We see this as a stimulant, a challenge, but also an opportunity. If we can make our style of farming more hip, maybe people would become interested in this modern style of farm life and work. People are always attracted to things that are hip. Chung's business venture has shown residents that trust and dignity can help make farming a respectable middle-class profession in the countryside. The next possible influencer in making farming sexy is a two-hour drive from Beijing in Tongzhou district and Mafang village. Though her approach to making agriculture attractive is a little different. Shi Yang is entrepreneur Cheng's wife. She's also concerned about young people leaving the land. Shi Yang runs a pioneering farm with a team at Tsinghua University. She's trying to start not a business, but a whole community of local small-scale farmers. In reality, I think a very important component of agricultural sustainability is having sustainable people to farm. Who will do it? We often ask this question. Who will be China's farmers in 10 years' time? Who will cultivate this land? Xi'an's first sign of success in reviving farming cooperatives, persuading Lang Jiu, one of the most experienced local farmers, to give her team's organic farming a try. Xi'an's also convinced Lang Jiu's 24-year-old son, Lang Jian Dong, to stay and work on the farm. With the four new greenhouses they're building, they could dramatically boost their family income. I think if one wishes to attract young people or attract farmers back to villages, first of all, they should allow farmers to have better income. This is very important, so they can live a respectable life in the village. For Shi Yan, the point of starting a cooperative, young people want not just status and wages, but a community life on the farm. I think it's important that we are able to improve communities in rural villages, their public amenities and welfare, so young people in the village have more opportunities to get together. So what about other young people coming back to farm? Lang Jiadong strikes a note of optimism tinged with caution. It's not possible to force everyone back to the village and do things they don't want to do. It's mostly dependent on their interests. As for helping parents, I think everyone should have the will to want to do so. And how to keep people like Lang Jiandong, who stayed on the land, from feeling old-fashioned and isolated? There's a simple answer. Chinese farmers now part of a wired-up nation. I think the Internet could really be important in attracting young people back. In China, the Internet is reaching more and more rural villages, especially villages near Beijing. 
so people in the villages can work and communicate with everyone. To attract young people, we have to come up with a different vision, a new farmer who is in harmony with nature, one who has a good sense of community, a farmer who, with new technology, is no longer isolated, but communicates with the whole world. So the new technology can give the young farmers a completely new concept of farming from what they've had up to now. Back in Shanghai, Rand's out on the streets doing some market research. So why do young people in China's cities say they're here, not back on the farm? Everyone wants their lives to grow in a better direction, therefore, I think this is why people from villages want to come to cities. Development in villages is not as good as in the cities. If young people come to cities, they can see and learn more. My grandparents were farmers. They worked really hard so my parents could move to the city. So my parents don't want their children to go back to farming. In Shanghai's fresh food market, Rand's joined by a residence colleague, Jeff. It seems like the major lure of the city is economics, right? So uh, they're just able to, uh, what were you saying, Jeff, like double their money most yeah, of their yeah. life. So that seems to be the common... Yeah, because they have kids, right? They have to pay their tuition fees and they have their parents. Yeah. Right, and the single single children policy, right? Yeah. They have to, you know, get every best for their children, so they need this work to make more money. Sure. So it seems like it goes beyond just money issues, but also to the environment for their kids, like better education, better, yeah. more access to culture, or more access to the city, more cosmopolitan. Yeah. A lot of intangible benefits. In China and globally, there's now a debate going on about policy. Whether to spend state funds convincing young people there's an alternative to the cities, or whether that's fighting the tide of history. Why do rural people live for the city? Income is a very important factor. It's pivotal. There is no doubt about that. But income aside, it's the infrastructure of rural areas which is more important. By raising their standard of living, they will not be compelled to live for the cities. Uh, there are some problems uh, that the government have to uh, consider. One is when you make an investment in the infrastructure, in the roads, in the highways, in, the, uh, in uh, small cities, you have to be aware of the long trend of uh, population uh, uh, development. So you don't want to waste uh, too much money in, in those uh, areas. In these areas, in future, you know, people are going to uh, uh, all leave. Uh, so, so that's something we have to consider, yeah. Everybody, whether they are a rural child or an urban child, wants the same thing. They want good life, access to telephone, to television, you name it. If you have those same things available in rural areas, energy, social services, schools, and what have you, and the nightlife, people will stay there. But if, if you invest only in the urban areas, you are basically asking for trouble. A final business debrief, city style, for Rand and Sherry. With another hip couple, Xi Yan and Cheng, on board for their influencer strategy, they're ready to inspire other social tiers to stay, not go. The PhD, he's creating something for the top tip of the people, but that image or that dream actually is the model to influence the lower tier of people who will think farm is a nicer 
or some way they can actually make a living with. They reckon that using both their influencers and computer games like the latest Happy Farms, they can make a difference. We can actually create an entire campaign showcasing heroes plus the digital area of the Happy Farm 2.0 with different regions in addition to throwing in some education about uh, how kids eating healthier are smarter and getting better or more ahead in school. So we could probably create that entire thing. So at the end of the day, it's going to be a dream that we can put in their minds. But Historically, the Chinese government has supported the move to cities in its attempt to eradicate poverty. But it's also aware of the need to keep a young generation on the land. Currently, China has direct food subsidies, general subsidies for purchasing agriculture supplies, and subsidies for agriculture machinery and tools. These are all attempts to continually raise the income level of agriculture producers and the profit rate of the agriculture sector. They may have a campaign strategy, but Rand and Sherry are politely hinting Future food may have set them an impossible task. So in order to influence the 99% of people without leaving the village and want to like stay there and do the farming, and I think it's really uh, need some like government facility or some economy system into play. Why we can do the branding thing for the influence strategy, but maybe some economy system, a facility system need to be set up to make sure it goes smoothly. We can brand forever, but the problem is we're never going to convince them that the money that they could make in the city is going to somehow, you know, yeah. is going to be made just by them staying on the farm because of, you know. So I think uh, in terms of infrastructure, I think Sherry makes a really good point that the government would need to come in and figure out how economically it's viable for them to stay on the farm. So if there's no business model there, we can't really build and, and market something that doesn't have a fundamental business model to it. So, um, yeah, so those are our conclusions. conclusions. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs>Making sure there are enough young people to grow the food we need for the future may be a matter of policy more than persuasion, however modern.